Welcome to Meets Pad, a platform dedicated to sharing breakthrough knowledge that is accessible to the meats industry. On each episode, we will hear from meat specialists and professionals to talk about numerous topics in meat science, including animal welfare, meat production, meat quality, food safety, and so much more. Hello, me folks. Welcome back to the Meat Spot Podcast. Today, we're still on day two uh, during this uh, RMC 75. I'm, I'm just glad that I ran into into you. Actually, we're, I, I ran into Dr. Ger- Gerard. He's like, you already had me on the podcast. Why don't you have Dr. Komari on the podcast and pick his brain? So, Dr. Komari, welcome to, to the podcast. It's an honor to have you. Thank you. The honor is mine. Um, we were just discussing because we can talk pretty much about everything. Right. Uh, I know you've done a lot of research um, in tenderness and meat quality in the past. Right. And you were you, you were telling me about a little bit of the of the all your history, but I think we can start from where you are right now uh, and is some of the folks that, that you were you're right now based out of Clay Center, in Nebraska. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, where is uh, in the professional life? You're doing a lot of food safety work now, but I guess we can start from there and we can just move on. The How topic. far back do you want to go? So I, <laughs> I was originally from Iran. I was born and raised in a family that uh, basically had a completely vertical integration of uh, livestock production. So we my grandpa, we used to go to countryside, buy livestock, which would mostly be sheep in those days. Um, we would fatten them in our own feedlot. Then we had a retail outlet in a large city in those days, probably 100,000, 50, 100,000, um, 15 retail outlets. We would sell the sword in the old days, and which was your butcher shop. And I worked in that uh, concept, uh, in that business uh, for many years. And, I, and actually, I ran it when I was in 10th grade. And then, from an education point of view, I went to a very um, prestigious school in Iran. It was called, it was Shah's School. Got my bachelor's degree in animal science, and they came to, came to U.S. to basically continue my graduate education. I really did not know what major I wanted to do, but I ended up being insane in meat science. So, I got my master's from Texas A&M in Kingsville. It's not called, it used to be called Texas A&I. Um, then I got my PhD at Oregon State University, um, did a couple of postdoc, and went to um, U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Clayson, Nebraska, as a scientist, and continued my research work. All my PhD and 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 and, and subsequent work was related to understanding the biology of meat tenderness. What is it that regulates meat tenderness? The objective being use that information to improve meat quality, that way a consumer will have a satisfying eating experience. Then in 1993, um, I happened to be the uh, section leader or equivalent of department head at U.S. Meat Animal Research Center that the -the jack-in-the-box happened in the U.S., which was a massive shock to the system in terms of E. coli 015787. Then I was tasked to work on that. So for, for the next decade or so, I continued to work on meat science through my grad student and postdocs and colleague, and I fo- focus on meat, safe, uh, meat safety. In 2008, I joined um, this company called IEH Laboratory and Consulting Group as a person responsible for mo- meat division. So I work with the meat industry, members of meat industry, small to large, help them navigate through food safety issue. What are the technology they can use to enhance uh, uh, food safety, to produce the safest food possible to protect consumer and also protect the company so they don't get in trouble. So that's a really long version of yeah. the, what you asked. So. Um, so I can I can see that from a very early age, um, you were exposed to the meat industry, right? Absolutely. In your end. So do you think that that really had a huge effect on, on your career as, as to you wanted to do animal science? Maybe not sure yet about meat science, but you knew you want to be involved in the meat industry. I honestly didn't. You know, when, when I came to U.S. in 1978, computer was beginning to be important. I thought I wanted to go into that area. But, I mean, you just go back to your roots and somehow I ended up in animal science. 
uh, either comfort zone or your roots, whatever it is, I end up in animal science, and I'm glad I did, because it's you know you got family ties or background tied to that to that area. So, um, tell me uh, tell me a little bit about your work. Uh, we were talking about uh, earlier before we started recording the so or our audience or listenership and in, in this platform is. Yes, the Midtimes community, but also we we try to convey the message and that what's what's the science behind just slaughter and processing. Exactly. And, and there's a huge impact of what you do. And I, I always like to quote Dr. Cockings and when he said in the very first episodes the the processor has the quality in, in their hands. So that they have control over that if they do it right. Right. What, what are some of, from your experience, and I know it can be on and on, but maybe uh, some some tips. I mean, we're talking about maybe H-bone for those folks right. that want to maximize tenderness. Right. Um, just small things like that that can... So in terms of meat tenderness, what we have learned over the years, what regulates meat tenderness, essentially three things. Number one is connective tissue. Connective tissue is a tissue that basically connects muscle to the bone, function of muscle in the animal is to create uh, a movement so they create energy that energy is transmitted through connective tissue to the bone that's how you get locomotion right so the the more the muscles are using an animal the more connective tissue they have and uh, so they that would be the round cuts for example they have higher connective tissue that's one source of uh, conduct uh, affects meat tenderness so the higher the connective tissue the tougher the meat tend to be the second factor, we call them sarcomere length. Sarcomere length is basically the functional unit in the muscle. When muscle contracts and relax, that's the component. Components of that is when they slide past each other to generate the force that transmitted through connective tissue to skeletal muscle. Well, uh, and the third component is proteolysis, which I'll come back to that. So that very fact that we know sarcomere length affect meat tenderness, for example, people don't know that psoas major or tenderloin, it will always be tender. You don't really need to age tenderloin. And the reason for that is the way we hang the carcasses and Achilles uh, tendon, we are stretching that muscle as the, as the animal goes through rigor. So the resting length of a sarcomere length in a, in, a, in a live animal is about 1.7 micron, to, uh, two, sorry, two micron. But in a uh, psoas major, once the animal, uh, tenderloin, once the animal gone into full rigor, it's over three micron. So that, mu that, anim that muscle could be, it's tender all the time. And, and I actually can say in just about any animal it will be more tender. So that the, one of the ways to take advantage of this is that if you have room, because it takes um, a lot of space uh, in terms of rail space, is to hang the carcasses by H-bone as opposed to Achilles tendon. When you hang them on H-bone, you put more pressure uh, force on the longissimus muscle. That's where the most valuable cuts are, so you can stretch that muscle. When you're putting pressure on there, as the animal goes into rigor, which basically is exhausting all the energies it has, then the, mu the longissimus muscle gets fixed at a longer sarcomere length as opposed to when you hang the, sar the carcasses on a keyless tendon. So if you have a small process pr and you have room, that's the simplest way to do to get a lot of benefit from most valuable cut, cut of the muscle. You know, the, some of the muscle that you get less stretched with H-bone are the, the, the hindquarter muscle, which they, those are the predominant mechanism for that is connective tissue. So we have, to, so a, um, each centimeter, each inch is 2.54 centimeter, okay? Each centimeter is 10 millimeter. Each mil so you gotta go that way I, I, to, to, to calculate, tell you how much of a, how much of a, um, how many inches or what part of an inch, um, or how many, um, convert micron to, um, Let me do it. Yeah, why don't you do that? Say, uh, how many microns in an inch? 25,400 microns in an inch. Yeah, there you go, write that down. <laughs> but, it, but in a way, there is a, there is a, uh, a sarcomere length effect. Absolutely. It's, it's you know, that's, uh, flat iron is one of those muscles, because it sits on shoulder blade, it gets stretched 
during aging, that's why it's tender, because it's, it has longer mm -hmm. circular. Yeah. So that's a simple thing, a small process it can use to enhance the eating quality of the most valuable cuts, which is the uh, lunges, you know, the rib and loin. Now, the third component uh, of, of, that affects tenderness is called proteolysis. Okay, proteolysis basically means um, a uh, muscle is like a scaffolding that's put together. Like right? the key protein that hold that scaffolding together are subject to degradation by an enzyme, which we've been credited with with uh, showing the role of that enzyme is called calpanes, right? So um, during aging, that enzyme system uh, attacks those proteins that put the scaffolding together. That's how the meat will become tender, okay? Uh, not all the muscles are affected by proteolysis. So some muscles are affected by sarcomere length, more, more by sarcomere length, some are affected more by proteolysis. Some are more by connective tissue. So you do different things depending on what the basis of tenderness is. The stomach length one is just like we said. You hang the carcasses differently. And the connective tissue one, you cook those differently to get eating satisfaction. The one that are proteolysis predominantly will be the middle cuts of meat. Then you have to age those properly. So you don't want to consume any of those meats, middle meats uh, till good 21 days. Because if you eat them at one day or seven day postmortem or 12 days postmortem, you haven't given that muscle the full potential to go through proteolysis. So you, you want, that's why they say age the middle meat for an, some people do obsessive aging, like excessive aging, 42 days, etc. But you should go no less than 21 days. Yeah. And that aging is. All, all, uh, almost misunderstood, they think that happen on the carcass. That aging happens at the cellular level. So you can get a piece of meat, vacuum package it, put it in the refrigerator for 21 days. After 21 days, throw it in, ref in the freezer. But so you want to keep it fresh for 21 days to get the maximum benefit out of the potential for that muscle to become tender. Yeah. Okay. And, and we have to be careful uh, because we're talking mainly from animals, um, European genetics, right, uh, right. Angus, Red Angus, right. all that, all the, the stuff from, from right. the continental type cattle. Right. Uh, I was talking early today with uh, some of our customers in, uh, in this case, they were in Asia and, and they're just out of the blue. They were, they were, they had some issues right now. There's uh, a lot of people that have, uh, I've been farming, they have cattle, not only in the U.S., but also worldwide, that want to start doing some, uh, they want to process their own animals. So they want to do some slaughter and processing because they see more value than just s selling their cattle to a, a third party, it's just a uh, processor. So they want to they start doing it themselves. And one of the things like, the, one of the first things that I asked him, so what do you want to do? What's your type of genetics would you want to kill today and then tomorrow uh because y you think like just maybe not go too far to mexico uh pr primarily you'll have cebu cattle down there and maybe or not maybe if the the the, the market first it, it won't allow you to keep 21 days of meat because the market how it works on there they want to have the money quick but also you don't you don't have any tenderness benefit if you you do a 21 day depending on the on the on the genetics but that's something to consider we have some audience also not only in the states so but someplace so else. what what you tell those people the one of the best thing to do the people that do really well is to educate their consumers okay so you can tell the consumer what i'm telling you we're going to have to sell it to you before it's ready right but you can store it in your refrigerator for 21 days, and then a minimum of 14 days, no less than about 21 days before you use it, before you eat it. And you can eat it before that, but you may eat that muscle before it meets its maximum potential. So you educate them and they'll do the right. I have my family, they don't understand this, but I tell them they do that. <laughs> so, and this, the guys that wanna kill their own cattle, one of the biggest things that they need to be concerned about is food safety is that because often these guys don't have the right equipment, 
if they don't have the right equipment, they don't know what they're doing, they may get contamination of the carcass that create huge food safety problem. So I encourage those guys, and I'll be more than happy to, to, to uh, help them out, and we, or we can do a session on how to do that. But they need to be very careful when they get into that endeavor that don't create problem for them and, and their consumer. Now, if it's, it's okay to kill cattle for your own family consumption, um, you know, it may affect your immediate family, but if you start selling, then you create liability for yourself. That with respect to Zebu, actually we did that research um, in the late 80s. Um, Boss Indicus um, has a, um, genetically they are developed to grow in uh, subtropical areas of the world. They have the ability to, disease, uh, to resist a lot of disease that are common in, those uh, in, in, those, in that part of the world. Whether that's the cause or there, are, there have been selection associated with that, the proteolysis that I mentioned to you, that enzymatic system is not nearly as active in Zebu as it is in British and continental cattle. For that reason, 100% Zebu cattle is, uh, could be heck of a lot tougher than you you know bad eating experience. Just by nature. Just by nature. There's nothing you can do about it. But if you live in those areas, you got to have that cattle. Otherwise, you will not survive. But what we've shown, that there's a direct relationship between percent zebu and meat toughness. Okay? 25% has no effect. 50% almost has no effect. But it's almost a linear relationship. There is an effect, but that's not perceptible. At 75% and 100% is very perceptible. So that's why we say in those parts of the world, use that through genetics. So your cows be 100% zebu, your bulls would be, you know, you do AI or you have other bulls of, of British or other kind of breed. So you have F1, that'll be 50%. That way you don't have negative effect on the terminal crossing, negative effect on meat quality. So that's the way to, to address that. I don't want to... I don't want to go any longer because I know we can go on and on. You bet. Uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, your time, your you support. Bet. There's a lot, a lot of content and a lot of articles that you've written that, that have impacted a lot of our lives. Um, thank you. Yeah. And I appreciate you for that. And thank you a lot. I, I, I wish, and I think we're going to do more. Okay. Uh, it's, I'm going to get some questions from, from our audience and processors, and I'll, I'll give them to you. Sure. And we can get maybe part two on addressing because we can talk for hours Absolute. about tenderness and meat quality be yeah. happy to do what i can to help thank you a lot thank you so much thank you guys doing a good job